This court is not blind to the nationwide trends in which the spigot to access the United States most precious and fundamental right, the right to vote, depends on who controls the levers of power. In Florida, more than 154,000 citizens had their voting rights restored during the last gubernatorial administration's four years. Since 2011, a period of seven years, that figure has plummeted. Less than 3,000 people have received restoration. More than one in five Florida's African-American voting age population cannot vote. The question now is whether such a system passes constitutional muster. It does not. This should not be a close question. This one, though, is a very, very interesting case. This is James Michael Hand versus Rick Scott. You may know Rick Scott in his official capacity as the governor of Florida and a member of the state of Florida's executive clemency board. What is an executive clemency board? Well, let's read on and find out. Florida strips the right to vote from every man and woman who commits a felony. Understandable. To vote again, disenfranchised citizens must kowtow before a panel of high-level government officials over which Florida's governor has absolute veto authority. No standards guide this panel. Its members alone must be satisfied that these citizens deserve restoration. Until that moment, if it ever comes, these citizens cannot legally vote for presidents, governors, senators, representatives, mayors, or school board members. These citizens are subject to the consequences of bills, actions, programs, and policies that their elected leaders enact and enforce. But these citizens cannot ever legally vote unless Florida's governor approves restoration of this fundamental right. Florida's executive clemency board has, by rule, unfettered discretion in restoring voting rights. We can do whatever we want, quotes the governor at one clemency hearing. One need not search long to find alarming illustrations of this scheme in action. In 2010, a white man, Stephen Warner, cast an illegal ballot. Three years later, he sought the restoration of his voting rights. He went before the state's executive clemency board where Governor Scott asked him about his illegal voting. Actually, I voted for you, he said. The governor laughed. I probably shouldn't respond to that. A few seconds passed. The governor then granted the former felon his voting rights. This is a facial challenge to Florida's reenfranchisement scheme. Throughout this order, reenfranchisement and vote restoration will be used interchangeably. Plaintiffs and defendants both move for summary judgment on cross motions. Plaintiffs are a group of nine former felons who have completed their sentences, including probationary requirements, but are still not eligible to vote. Seven of the plaintiffs have had their restoration applications rejected. An eighth's application has been pending for years. A final plaintiff is not eligible to apply until June of 2019. In Florida, elected partisan officials have extraordinary authority to grant or withhold the right to vote from hundreds of thousands of people without any constraints, guidelines, or standards. The question now is whether such a system passes constitutional muster. It does not. Florida automatically disenfranchises any individual convicted of a felony. But the Constitution authorizes the governor, with the approval of two other board members, to restore civil rights— the Office of Executive Clemency, quote, was created to assist in the orderly and expeditious exercise of this executive power. The board is guided by the rules of executive clemency, the rules. The rules are intended to limit the authority or discretion of the board. The governor alone has the unfettered discretion to deny clemency at any time for any reason. The governor and two board members have the unfettered discretion to grant at any time for any reason several types of clemency, including the restoration of voting rights. The rules outline the procedures former felons must undertake to have their voting rights restored. Former felons must wait either five or seven years from the completion of their sentence, including probation, parole, and fines to apply for restoration depending on the severity of the crime. The board generally meets four times a year. 
applicants are not required to attend their hearings, but the rules encourage applicants to attend. If applicants attend, they may speak for no more than five minutes. Others may speak in the applicant's favor, but the whole presentation cannot exceed ten minutes. In making its decisions, the board can examine, but does not have to, assorted factors. These factors include drug and alcohol use, traffic violations, whether the applicant has voted despite legally being disenfranchised, employment status, family, and the board's perceptions on the applicant's attitude, level of remorse, and whether she or he has turned her life around. If an applicant is denied restoration, she cannot apply for at least two years. An individual's status as a former felon does not deprive her of a vote restoration process free from the First Amendment's protections. Defendants assert that once a felon loses the right to vote, she loses all interests associated with that right, including those under the First Amendment, until her voting rights are restored. This court finds defendants' reasoning to be nonsensical. It is well settled that a state can disenfranchise convicted felons under Section 2 of the 14th Amendment, but it is also well settled that a state cannot disenfranchise a convicted felon if motivated by racial animus. We are confident, the Supreme Court stated, that Section 2 was not designed to permit the purposeful racial discrimination which otherwise violates Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, nor may a state disenfranchise a convicted felon for any arbitrary reason. Nor can we believe that Section 2 would permit a state to make a completely arbitrary distinction between groups of felons with respect to the right to vote. State laws and regulations cannot, for example, disenfranchise similarly situated blue-eyed felons but not brown-eyed felons. If a state cannot disenfranchise for arbitrary reasons, a state cannot disenfranchise convicted felons in a manner repugnant to the First Amendment. A state cannot yank the right to vote away from a Republican felon but retain voting rights for Democratic felons. Imagine a state bold enough to set in place a process, perhaps concurrent with criminal sentencing, where a panel of elected officials, empowered with boundless discretion but with a clear interest in shaping the electorate, decided that some felons can retain voting rights but others would be permanently barred from choosing their elected representatives. Such a scheme might be arbitrary. It might also violate the First Amendment. Neither would be constitutional. This hypothetical scheme is similar to a Mississippi disenfranchisement structure that the Fifth Circuit found problematic in Williams v. Taylor. A county election board denied a black felon voting rights pursuant to a state law, but the record showed other felons in the community who had not been disenfranchised, although they fell within the statute. The Fifth Circuit concluded that the county election board cannot discriminate arbitrarily among felons who fall within a group classified for mandatory disenfranchisement. While a felon has no right to vote, he has the right not to be the arbitrary target of the board's enforcement of the statute. We find this reasoning to be persuasive. When a state institutes a process to restore voting rights to felons who have completed their sentences, that process cannot permit purposeful racial discrimination. A state could not choose to reenfranchise voters only of one particular race. A re- restoration cannot be arbitrary. A state cannot reenfranchise only those felons who are six feet tall, blue-eyed, born in August, root for the Florida Gators, or who call heads during a coin flip, nor can it violate the First Amendment. Defendants essentially argue that vote restoration for former felons can only occur on the state's terms. Once a felon loses the right to vote, only the state may grant it back in the manner of its choosing. A person convicted of a crime may have long ago exited the prison cell and completed probation. Her voting rights, however, remain locked in the dark crypt. Only the state has the key, but the state has swallowed it. Only when the state has digested and passed the key in the unforeseeable future, maybe in five years, maybe in 50, along with the possibility of some virus-laden stew of viewpoint discrimination and partisan religious racial bias, does the state, in an act of mercy, unlock the former felon's voting rights from its hiding place. Former felons' pathway back to full citizenship, one in which these members of Florida's communities have a voice in their selection of their government, cannot be tainted by even the slightest stench of viewpoint discrimination. A state may disenfranchise convicted felons. A particularly punitive state may even disenfranchise convicted felons permanently. But once a state provides for restoration, the process cannot offend the Constitution. Plaintiffs have the right to free association and expression under the First Amendment.
Because the First Amendment protections in the context of felony reenfranchisement is a matter of first impression, this court first identifies the scope of these protections. If plaintiffs were, for example, alleging First Amendment violations on the discretion a police officer has in penalizing a speeding driver with a friendly warning or a steep monetary fine, the inquiry would be brief. There is no First Amendment protection against an officer issuing a fine versus a warning. Here, however, Florida's vote restoration scheme violates two First Amendment rights, namely free association and free expression. On free association... It is beyond debate that freedom to engage in association for the advancement of beliefs and ideas is an inseparable aspect of the liberty assured by the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, which embraces the freedom of speech. Associational rights are grounded on the principles that there is safety and power in numbers. People associate with others in pursuit of a wide variety of political, social, economic, educational, religious, and cultural ends. Conversely, protecting associational rights is crucial in preventing the majority from imposing its views on groups that would rather express other, perhaps unpopular, ideas. Effective advocacy of both public and private points of view, particularly controversial ones, is undeniably enhanced by group association. The right to associate is afforded particular protection in the realm of political association. Political belief and association constitute the core of those activities protected by the First Amendment. The right of individuals to associate for the advancement of their political beliefs ranks among our most precious freedoms. There can no longer be any doubt that freedom to associate with others for the common advancement of political beliefs and ideas is a form of orderly group activity protected by both the First and Fourteenth Amendments, quoting NAACP versus Button. Political association is, like associational rights generally, based on the principle that like-minded individuals can act in concert to influence policy in the political and electoral spheres. A common thread runs through associational rights cases. Courts are deeply averse to state laws, regulations, and schemes that threaten political associations by favoring one association or party over others. The Supreme Court struck down an Ohio law that gave the two old established parties a decided advantage over any new party struggling for existence and thus placed substantially unequal burdens on both the right to vote and the right to associate. The court also invalidated an Ohio law that amounted to a desire to protect existing political parties from competition, for competition from campaign workers, voter support, other campaign resources generated by independent candidates who have previously been affiliated with the party. In Tash Jian v. Republican Party of Connecticut, the Supreme Court struck down a Connecticut law requiring would-be primary voters to register with a party before voting in that party's primary. Such a scheme was an impermissible burden on associational rights because it limited the party's associational opportunities at the crucial juncture at which the appeal to common principles may be translated into concerted action, and hence to political power in the community. The court, in short, has repeatedly recoiled from anything that resembles a thumb on the scales of association and, by extension, the democratic process. On the right to free expression, an individual has the right to express his or her views without the risk of censorship. Government suppression of political expression based on its actual or perceived content is one of the most repugnant actions uh, that the First Amendment prevents. Above all else, the First Amendment means that the government has no power to restrict expression because of its message, its ideas, its subject matter, or its content. If there is a bedrock principle underlying the First Amendment, it is that the government may not prohibit the expression of an idea simply because society finds the idea itself offensive or disagreeable. The Supreme Court has not clearly characterized voting as a form of expression and explicitly declined to do so in 1966. We do not stop to canvass the relation between voting and political expression, the court said in Harper v. Virginia Board of Elections. On the one hand, the court observed that an election's primary purpose is to choose candidates rather than provide a means of giving vent to short-range political goals, peak, or personal quarrels. Ballots serve primarily to elect candidates, not as forums for political expression. More recently, a majority of the court rejected a public official's First Amendment challenge to a Nevada law prohibiting him from voting because of a conflict of interest. 
Although the court rejected the official's argument holding that legislative power is not personal to the legislator but belongs to the people, it also cited from Burdick and Timmons and concluded a legislator has no right to use official powers for expressive purposes. On the other hand, the court has never unequivocally severed the right to vote from the right to expression. It has occasionally identified expressive elements in voting. The right of citizens to create and develop new political parties, the court has stated, derives from the First and Fourteenth Amendments and advances the constitutional interest of like-minded voters to gather in pursuit of common political ends, thus enlarging the opportunities of all voters to express their own political preferences. Citizens have strong interests to associate together to express their support for a candidate and her views. Voting is, among other things, a form of speech, says Citizens United v. Federal Election Commission. The Supreme Court has identified an array of political activities as deserving protection under the First Amendment. In Citizens United, the court overruled precedent and struck down a federal law prohibiting corporate independent expenditures within certain time periods before elections because it was a ban on speech. In Doe v. Reed, the Supreme Court recognized petition signing in the context of Washington's ballot referendums as expressing the political view that the question should be considered by the whole electorate. Even though this expressive act may ultimately have the legal consequence of requiring Washington to hold a referendum, the court did not see how adding such legal effect to an expressive activity somehow deprives that activity of its expressive component, taking it outside the scope of the First Amendment. Partisan redistricting also has First Amendment implications. The First Amendment may be more relevant constitutional provision in future cases that allege unconstitutional partisan gerrymandering because such schemes implicate voters' First Amendment interest of not burdening or penalizing citizens because of their association with a political party or their expression of political views. Recently, a three-judge panel struck down North Carolina's congressional redistricting maps partly because it violated voters' First Amendment rights. In the absence of binding precedent holding that this right to vote is wholly independent of the right to free expression, this court finds persuasive the idea that the First Amendment protects more than just the individual on a soapbox and the lonely pamphleteer. After all, laws enacted to control or suppress speech may operate at different points in the speech process. No right is more precious in a free country than having a voice in the election of those who make the laws. In count one, plaintiffs claim that Florida officials' unfettered discretion in restoring voting rights violates the First Amendment. This court agrees. Unfettered executive discretion imposes serious burdens on plaintiffs' First Amendment rights to free association and free expression. But Florida goes several steps further. The ultimate re-enfranchisement decision is in the hands of four high-level elected officials. The governor must assent to the restoration. The board has, by rule, unfettered discretion in making these consequential decisions at any time. Courts view unfettered governmental discretion over protected constitutional rights with profound suspicion. This court reviews laws permitting such official discretion when they burden citizens' First Amendment rights under an exact standard of scrutiny. The question is whether the Clemency Board's limitless power over plaintiffs' vote restoration violates their First Amendment rights to free association and free expression. It does. This should not be a close question. Defendants argue that the vote restoration structure furthers a state interest in limiting the franchise to responsible voters, and according to defendants, individualized review allows the board to gauge the progress and rehabilitation of former felons. Nonetheless, the means Florida employs to achieve these ends does not survive such strict scrutiny. A state may have a legitimate interest in limiting the franchise to responsible individuals. Indeed, 48 states bar in some form or another incarcerated men and women from casting ballots during elections. At the time the 14th Amendment passed, 29 states prohibited convicted felons from voting. Limiting the vote to non-felons has been a state interest for many years, including in Florida. But Florida does not use the least restrictive means to pursue its interests in preventing possibly irresponsible citizens from choosing their leaders. Even when pursuing legitimate interests, a state may not choose means that unnecessarily restrict a constitutionally protected liberty. 
Florida's vote restoration scheme is crushingly restrictive. This scheme crumbles under strict scrutiny because it risks, if not covertly authorizes the practice of, arbitrary and discriminatory vote restoration. When a scheme allows government officials to do whatever they want, viewpoint discrimination can slip through the cracks of a seemingly impartial process. Such discrimination can lead to a denial of the fruits of their association, to wit, former Fallon's political aspect or widespread insidious bias to benefit the governor's political party. State officials' potential political, racial, or religious biases cannot poison the well of vote restoration. Viewpoint discrimination is deeply antithetical to the Constitution and our nation's long-standing values. In Florida, the risk of viewpoint discrimination is distressingly real. Plaintiffs identify several instances of former felons who professed political views amenable to the board's members who then received voting rights, while those who expressed contrary political views to the board who were denied the same rights. Applicants, as well as other character witnesses, have routinely invoked their conservative beliefs and values to their benefits. Some disparities arise when applicants criticize the system. For example, a Navy veteran decried felon disenfranchisement before the governor rejected his application because of traffic infractions. But 10 former felons who did not speak out against felony disenfranchisement were re-enfranchised despite less than perfect traffic records. That's not all. Similar conduct can lead to different results in front of the board. The governor asked one former felon about an illegal vote he cast. He said he voted for the governor. The governor then restored Warner's voting rights. But plaintiffs identify five former felons who at other points were questioned about illegal ballots and then rejected on that basis. It is not lost on this court that four of the five rejected applicants are African American. It is of no consequence to this court that plaintiffs have not pled any claim or advanced any argument that defendants have ever actually engaged in such invidious discrimination. It is exactly that board members could that is so troublesome. The unfettered discretion that the clemency board possesses over a former felon's reenfranchisement violates the First Amendment. Accordingly, plaintiff's motion for summary judgment on count one is granted, and defendant's motion is denied. On count three, plaintiffs argue that the board's lack of clear time limits in processing and deciding clemency applications violates the First Amendment. Specifically, the absence of time limits creates the risk of arbitrary delays and arbitrary continued different disenfranchisement. The lack of time limits in processing and deciding vote restoration applications risks viewpoint discrimination and is therefore unconstitutional. Accordingly, plaintiff's motion for summary judgment on count three is granted and defendant's motion is denied. This court finds untenable defendant's belief that all the cherished First Amendment rights, values, traditions, and protections from state intrusion laid out in Section 2B above are negated by the squid-like tendrils of an asterisk next to former felons' names, the asterisk of disenfranchisement authorized by three words in the Fourth Amendment's Section 2 that if defendant had their way would exclude millions of American men and women from basic First Amendment protection. Only one wedded to the rotten landscape of a hyper-formalist worldview would claim that when a state strips the fundamental right to vote from its incarcerated citizens, it also strips all rights intertwined with voting, the right to associate in a political party, the ultimate expression in a democratic society, and the fruits of their association and their political impact. It is legal chicanery to argue an individual convicted of a crime loses her First Amendment associational and expressive interest in the political sphere simply because these rights relate to voting. Turning to count two, this court finds that Florida's vote restoration scheme, permitting unfettered official discretion to restore voting rights, also violates the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Plaintiffs largely base their equal protection argument on Bush v. Gore. Plaintiffs focus on the admonition that the right to vote is protected in more than the initial allocation of the franchise. Having once granted the right to vote on equal terms, the state may not, by later arbitrary and disparate treatment, value one person's vote over another. This court adheres to the boundaries the Founding Fathers placed in the United States Constitution, not to ethereal concepts like acts of grace. One firm boundary is the prohibition on states to deny citizens equal protection of the laws. This court has already explained that executive clemency schemes are not immune from federal court review simply because they are executive clemency schemes. 
In short, Florida's scheme violates the 14th Amendment. Plaintiff's motion for summary judgment as to count two is granted. Defendant's motion for summary judgment as to count two is denied. Furthermore, the five- and seven-year waiting periods do not violate the First and Fourteenth Amendments. Accordingly, plaintiff's motion for summary judgment on count four is denied, and defendant's motion as it relates to count four is granted. Having determined that Florida's vote restoration scheme is unconstitutional, this court must determine the appropriate relief. This court could simply issue a judgment for declaratory relief. As for injunctive relief, this court cannot issue an order that is tantamount to saying, act right. The parties have, so far, not adequately briefed this court on remedies. Accordingly, the parties must submit additional briefing as to the contours of injunctive relief, if any, in light of this order by Monday, February 12th, 2018. This court does not lightly impose tight timelines on parties, but unique circumstances are at play in this challenge. The vote restoration process is constitutionally infirm, but in so finding, this court has effectively prevented otherwise eligible felons from seeking restorations under Florida's unconstitutional scheme. Such a course of action runs counter to Florida's constitution. The state constitution authorizes the governor may restore civil rights. The Florida constitution does not start with the presumption that the governor may not restore the right, which this order effectively, though temporarily, does. Rather, the governor's power is permissive. Moreover, Florida's constitution also expressly bars felons from voting until restoration of civil rights. The Florida constitution presumes a restoration process exists. This court will not prevent, even briefly, the express preferences of Florida's constitution without giving the parties an opportunity to address the appropriate remedy. This court is not blind to the nationwide trends in which the spigot to access the United States, most precious and fundamental right, the right to vote, depends on who controls the levers of power. That spigot is turned on or off depending upon whether politicians perceive they will benefit from the expansion or contraction of the electorate. In Florida, more than 154,000 citizens had their voting rights restored during the last gubernatorial administration's four years. Since 2011, a period of seven years, that figure has plummeted. Less than 3,000 people have received restoration. The context of these numbers is not lost on the court. More than one-tenth of Florida's voting population, 1.7 million as of 2016, cannot vote because they have been decimated from the body politic. More than one in five Florida's African-American voting age population cannot vote. If any one of these citizens wishes to earn back their fundamental right to vote, they must plod through a gauntlet of constitutionally infirm hurdles. No more. When the risk of state-sanctioned viewpoint discrimination skulks near the franchise, it is the province and the duty of this court to exercise such potential bias from infecting the clemency process. Accordingly, it is ordered. Plaintiff's motion for summary judgment as to counts 1, 2, and 3 is granted. Defendant's motions 1, 2, 3 is denied. Plaintiff's motion for count 4 is denied. Defendant's count 4 is granted. The party shall file briefings related to the remedies before February 12th. The court does not direct entry of final judgment and will not do so until after it has considered the additional briefings as to remedies so ordered Mark Walker, United States District Judge. The judge is saying that the judge isn't an expert on fixing voter, rest voter registration and clemency problems. So the judge wants to hear from the parties as well before the judge crafts a remedy rather than the judge just trying to figure one out himself or herself, in this case himself. Right. So this is appealable. This could be appealed by Rick Scott to the whichever circuit court of appeals represents Florida. I forget. But yeah, the judge said, you know, so short summary, the judge said that you can't have the governor and the clemency board making decisions arbitrarily over which felons have regained their right to vote and which have not it has to be more cut and dry than that it can't be something that's decided on a case-by-case -case basis and definitely not something that's decided based on an interview with the governor about who you voted for right so that sort of as the as the judge said unfettered discrimination whether or not the the but the the party doing the discrimination or accused of the discrimination or accused of the unfetteredness 
whether or not they're actually discriminating or they're benevolent and they're not discriminating. It's the fact that they have that unfettered power and they shouldn't have that unfettered power. And then it seemed like the judge dropped the bomb at the end. There were 154,000 clemencies granted, you know, vote, voting rights granted before Governor Scott. And then after 2011, only 3,000 have been granted. Holy mackerel. Yeah. Yeah. The court makes it clear the state can say no one who is a convicted felon can vote ever again. They can say no one, they can say only people who served their sentence, but they can't say only white people, only black people, only six foot tall people, only blue eyed people, or in this case, only people who appease the governor and he says, okay. It's not appease the governor with a set of black and white criteria that are not discriminatory in on, on any sort of like illegal or unjust fashion it's it's go and talk to the governor answer his questions and then we'll see that's that's pretty authoritarian yeah and honestly like i don't i don't trust people i don't i wouldn't even trust me i wouldn't want to be the one person in charge of everything either because it feels like it's a human thing to want to protect your position in life even if you have to be a little bit scumbaggy about it so i don't i wouldn't trust anybody who's got that power and i think that's what the judge is saying here that we can't we can't trust that situation even even in the hypothetical situation where it's not being abused we can't trust that situation so either you know somebody's got to figure out what florida wants to do now because they can't do this that's what the judge is saying i do want to thank my uh, my sponsors and supporters and all that of course, you can sponsor this channel and make sure that we have more videos and more dogs and the dogs get more toys and, and I can buy more camera equipment and buy more lighting as we need and all that by supporting us at patreon.com slash ljfrench. Or I believe we also have sponsus.org slash law. Thank you very much to my February supporters. My $50 plus supporters on Patreon are John Steele, Gavin Barnard, The God Slain, Evie, Andy, Kyle Mudrak, John H. Anderson, and Vera Mantain. And there are over a hundred five dollar plus supporters. I think I th it might be a hundred, just over a hundred five dollar plus supporters scrolling on the LED panel behind me. And when I post these VODs, you'll be in the description of those videos. And we're trying to figure out um, more and better rewards for the supporters. Right now, you get the Patreon panel, which is cool, but like we can do better. So uh, I, we have the the half an hour pre-show that we do every Sunday. So that's kind of like a, a place to come and hang out with me and get a little bit of more personal interaction because there's fewer, just fewer people in general. But I'd like to have more rewards for the patrons and also offer more tiers as well so that uh you know a twenty dollar supporter might might get something in between the fifty dollar level or something i don't know so if you have any ideas for me there because i know so many of you are full of so many good ideas please please let us know um with that said i'll i'll flash my my fly in one more time <laughs> because we worked so hard on it uh business at lawfulmasses.com by the way guys if you have any ideas for the channel that you want us to go over love you all i'm leonard french your favorite copyright attorney and i'll see you bye <laughs>